All right, so welcome everyone to week seven. Those of you here in person in Canyon, always delighted to have, uh, have some here uh, in person. And then all of you online, those that will watch later by YouTube. Can't hear anything. Huh, Brian, can you hear me fine? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. All right, so whoever was struggling with that, I don't know, uh, audio uh, on yours, make sure it's turned up. But uh, so week seven, and I wanna be sure and go ahead and add uh, right off before I forget uh, at the end uh, that we do not meet next week, spring break. Uh, so um, do not, um, sign on next week and uh, two weeks from tonight, Susan and I will be back down in Houston. So those of you here won't be with you in person here, uh, but we'll be, we'll be down there. And so, um, well, as we uh, get ready to start, as we've done each time, either Ryan or myself uh, uh, mm. just, pausing for us to spend just a, a few quiet moments uh, in, in prayer. Uh, and uh, of course, whenever we're still before the Lord doing a, a little less talking, we will touch on that tonight. The, as we talk about faith, doubt, different ways of knowing, maybe some deeper ways of knowing the Lord. And part of that involves uh, an apophatic approach or uh, away from speech without speech, which is hard for us to think of much prayer without speech, but the, the scriptures where the Lord, you know, urges us to stillness and quietness and silence. Um, Habakkuk 2, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silent before him. Uh, and then more than that, that, that it's a very, it's one appropriate, very appropriate posture for us before the Lord is the stillness. So let's pause to pray some together with and without speech, and then we will carry on with our study. So let's pray. Loving Father, we do come uh, before your throne of grace, so thankful that we can come to you. We, we do come with gratitude, with thanksgiving. We are so grateful for the love and mercy that you show, for the, the kindness, the patience that you show us through Christ. Uh, thank you that we can come right into your presence, into your very throne room. And Father, sometimes we do come with so many words, so many thoughts. And we thank you that you call us uh, to stillness, to quietness. Uh, we thank you, Father that we can fellowship with you even without the words at times. We all come with a full day uh, under our belt today, um, come with different degrees of busyness uh, here at the end of the day. But Father, before we go into our study tonight, we always want to pause and be very intentional about saying you are welcome into our presence, how we need you. Father, we, we can talk about knowing you, but oh, how deeply we need to be able to, to know you in our hearts, even without all of the accompanying words to know your heart, uh, to know your love uh, for all people. So, Father, we just 
pause for some moments of stillness and quietness here uh, in your presence. These are only a few moments of silence, Father. We, we know we need extended periods in your presence to, to gaze at you, to reflect on the beauty of Christ. You tell us to be still and remind ourselves you are God and we are not. And that's therapeutic cathartic for our own hearts, Father, to just be able to, to lay ourselves in your hands. Father, we all come with people that we love and care about, uh, that have needs, whether friends, family members, our own lives, we have tensions, pressures, stressors, and things that, that won't be resolved uh, by praying about them right here. They won't be, they won't be all worked out or uh, reach a, a good conclusion just here tonight. So Father, teach us, continue to teach us how to be at peace uh, in the midst of the turmoil in our lives for all the things that uh, may be weighing on us now we just bring that to you appreciating the image of brother in christ many years ago in preparing to rest verbalizing that now Father, I hand all of these things over to you. I'm going to take some rest for myself. Your shoulders can handle it through the night while we rest. And so we, we do it, Father, with that kind of a heart, saying we can rest from carrying this for a while. Jesus, you telling us, uh, um, take your yoke your way of seeing things, your way of trusting in the Father. Take it upon us and we'll find rest for ourselves. So meet all of the needs represented here among us tonight. Meet those needs in Christ. And Father, help us to, to rest in your loving gaze. We don't have to beautify ourselves in some way. But we can just be still. Your gaze upon us and know that you look with love, mercy, and compassion. And let us just find peace that comes from your spirit as we are certain of your love for us and our place with you. Guide us by your spirit as we study tonight. We can't know your heart without your spirit leading us into the depths of your heart. So do that with us all together, jointly as a community of faith. Let us know the height and depth of, of your love. And let our hearts be warmed and encouraged through our time in our study together tonight. Let Jesus be lifted up. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Um, let me get this up so I can see when someone 
and you David, are you able to hear us now? Mm, maybe not. May have dropped out and will hopefully be able to come back in. So, all right. Well, we will um, continue on. So, hand out that assent to you today. Uh, you, scriptures at the end that you'll reflect on. You have a couple of weeks. There's more scripture than usual there. You'll have a couple of weeks, but as we often do, let's just as we look at the focus of tonight, faith, doubt, different kinds of knowing, uh, uh, a few reflections here, excerpts from uh, some others, brothers and sisters, roar um, from things hidden. What he's trying to keep us from is a lust for certitude and undue need for explanation, resolution, and answers. Uh, frankly, that kind of lust for certitude makes biblical faith impossible may seem counterintuitive at the beginning when we uh, when we hear that but i think if we really reflect on it that if we if we demand we can see the logic in it if we demand certainty uh, absolute certainty uh, no questions no just again the thoughts been expressed in different ways through the decades through the ages, just give it to me black and white, that, that there, there is no room for faith there. Uh, a demand for certainty, we've got an echo, let me try that. Demand for certainty uh, displaces, it crowds out, it squeezes out uh, faith. Uh, faith is uh, trusting in what we cannot see um other not to spend too much time on it you're welcome to respond any of them you know may disagree with uh with some that is okay uh Derek flood similar thought because in the final analysis faith is not about certainty faith is about humility and trust and again you know that that makes sense to us there uh faith is about humility and and trust we say okay yeah uh faith, trust, you know, somewhat uh, synonymous. Um, maybe we're just not used, though, to thinking that it's not about certainty. And that doesn't mean that we, we, can't, we can't know and have convictions about Christ, what we believe. Again, we'll, we'll be bringing up Paul again in 2 Timothy tonight. Uh, I trust the... Uh, the uh the gist of it begins to come across let's go ahead and, and finish these another one by roar together with uh uh, uh Morel. those who demand certitude out of life will insist on it even if it doesn't fit the facts we've turned faith into a right to certitude when in fact this trinitarian mystery is whispering quite the opposite we have to live in exquisite terrible humility before uh, reality of god and in his presence, let me uh, make that a little bit uh, larger. And we can, I think, again, if we're if we're brutally honest with ourselves, we can see uh, truth in that. That if we've sometimes been like uh, uh, hell bent on being able to wrap our minds, our brains around concept thought that. Uh, we very likely are in danger of shaping those regardless of the fact whether it fits the facts or not. If certitude, uh, you know, no, uh, no gray areas, no, no questions, if that is our pursuit, uh, we, we certainly don't, we don't see that model for us in scripture. Paul constantly talking about the mystery that we have in Christ doesn't mean that it's something that is absolutely unknowable, unattainable, but it's going to be on a different level. Uh, it's going to be in a different way. Uh, we just finished in Philippians 3 in the previous class, and Paul, it's kind of like Paul would be saying, you want to know 
uh, what someone looks like who demands certainty uh, in, in all aspects of their life. Well, here's a picture of me uh, as I was born, you know, circumcised, a tribe of Benjamin, uh, as to the law, you know, Pharisee, righteousness of the law, I was faultless. Uh, he said, that's what, a, that's what a being looks like uh, that demands absolute clarity and certainty as, as being enslaved to that pursuit. He says, but I count all of that as, and then we clearly said the word there is more like human excrement. I count all of that as just excrement, excrement in light of the great value of knowing Christ. So I, I pray that we see that Paul, uh, even in his life in um, teaching, you know, makes this, uh, you know, brings out that component of mystery to us. Then Pope Francis, uh, a book that I went through of his, The Name of God is Mercy. I just uh, remember this for the past several years since reading it. Only he who has been touched and caressed by the tenderness of his mercy really knows the Lord. And again, I think with a little bit of reflection on our part, if we think of someone maybe that um, tends, has struggled with legalism in their lives, um, that uh, maybe is to the point of even being mean-spirited, we, we could say without, not in a judgmental way, but we could say, ah, there's something missing there about really knowing the Lord. Uh, and when Pope Francis stated it this way, it's like, yeah, I hear that, that, that rings true with me because uh, if I don't know the Lord in a tender way, uh, then I don't really know him. And Jesus really says something to that effect, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 20, 21, there'll be those that say, we were all about you. Uh, we had all kinds of, of knowledge. We cast out demons uh, in your name. And he will say, depart. I don't know you. The, both Hebrew and Greek, but the word there being that intimate knowledge, a, a deep intimate knowledge and a close human. It doesn't have to be just husband and wife, but that can be one relationship. But in a, in a human relationship where there is deep, intimacy of of mind and heart uh, he's saying I, I don't know you in that way so we we know that from jesus himself and paul that uh they are putting forth a picture to us there is another level of knowing beyond just the uh the the facts that i can wrap my brain around and that that level of knowing is indispensable for us as followers of, of Jesus. So as an intro, I pray that's, that's helpful in reflecting a bit. Um, I do have a, a text here from David that he's just not able to, he's back on with us, but maybe, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think he's able to hear now. Okay, all right. So, so Son, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you to begin working through. Ryan and I acknowledged that we won't get through all of this. There was a, a good bit in the notes there, uh, but uh, we will uh, work to cover some of the, the main points. So go ahead, son. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so uh, today, as you can see, and even with the notes, um, I thought it'd be helpful just to go through um, the different ways in which we can know. And, uh, you know, dominantly, we talk about two different ways. And we're going to do that tonight, mainly because, um, in a way, it's the simplest. And it, I think it allows us to have the understanding pretty clear. Though, as I note up there, and you could do the same thing with the trying, trying brain and the three intelligence centers of the body that have largely been researched now. And I think we're all very familiar now of the ways in which our <clears throat> brain, obviously, but also your heart and your gut functions as intelligence centers, which is very important and very interesting and would be worth talking about, but we're just going to bypass that for the moment. And um, we want to talk 
just here as it relates to the different ways of knowing so that we can say something about what does knowledge and or knowing mean specifically as it relates to God and or spiritual things. Um, and there's, there's so much that we have here, but there's also so much that we left out and needless to say, if you're thinking about some texts in uh, the letters that refer to these kinds of things, you're right. And we just did not have space nor ability to bring those in. So this was originally to be pretty simp simple and then um, things just kept getting added on. So dominantly um, <clears throat> in several different ways, and there's been two, two primary ways of knowing and largely talked about by several different, not just epistemologists, but philosophers, but then going even further back towards first century Judaism in a Greco understanding, um, the words that I think are interesting that are worth paying attention to um, that we find in scripture as well, are uh, dianoia and epinoia. And so noia being mind um, or thoughts. And so dia, D, di um, being the prefix that relates to two, as in to sever, as in to divide, as in diablos, the one who divides, the hasatan. So di, di being that which is <clears throat> creates two and or is dualistic and or severs and or we can largely think of, and that doesn't have to be a negative way, we can largely think of language. Language is that which um, divides in the, in the sense that it sparses out one word to this, one word to that, one word to that. It is inherently a, a dualistic system, all language is, and that's why it's so helpful. And of course, that's why it has its limits as well. Um, but of course, so the dianoia would be the deductive, rational, logic, explicit knowledge um, about that, speaking about something, um, of course, closed ended by way of um, trying to find some, some language and or a conclusive way of talking about something. Of course, it doesn't have to be. If it's within a scientific mode, it can't be open-ended. And then epinoia, which as you can even just read there, epi being that which is above, um, very similar relationship to metanoia, um, <clears throat> which is, but epinoia, interestingly, as that which is above the mind, that which is above our uh, language's capacity to actually uh, articulate. So not just knowledge from above is one way of saying it, but another way of saying it is that it's a, above rhetoric, it's above language, it's above articulation, it surpasses um, the finite mind's ability to articulate. So this type of knowing, of course, is made famous in the last 50 years by Michael Pollyani, who use, utilized the term tacit knowing, um, which is another way of talking about that which is felt or known in a deep kind of way of which you have no ability to articulate why or how you know that. Um, so it's kind of a know-how. It's a, it's a learn. It, it, well, it doesn't have to be learned. It could be an intuitive but it's also personal and it's relational. It's the type of knowing that is open-ended in that um, while I know you, any one of you, there's an infinite amount of things about you and with you that I do not know, that I have not experienced. And as such, it is always limited and it always knows its limits. It always knows that I know in part, but not yet in full. Now, the reason why that's interesting to me is because we get to the next session. And <clears throat> the reason why I think this is helpful is because I, unfortunately, I, I feel that the neurology of, of knowing and how we know is normally left out of these conversations, which is unfortunate because, you know, the hardware with which we are working theoretically has an impact on how we know and what we know. So theoretically, I think it would be a good idea to have some idea as to what is going on um, in the brain. And one of the things, and we don't have to go deep into this, and we most certainly, it would be a very surface level look, but I'll give you two, two works that will go much deeper. Uh, one of them is one of the most important works of the last 50 years um, by Inmo Gokrist, The Master and the Emissary. And I'll just go ahead and say that um, the primary thesis that is being put across there is that neurologically speaking, uh, the right brain is created and, and by way of the system, the right brain is dominant and or there is a very helpful way in which if the right brain is dominant, 
it allows us to function in a particular way. And thus the master would be the right brain, um, you know, theoretically, you know, neurologically. And the emissary, you know, it's servant, it's slave, but you can say servant, um, would be the left brain. And now he puts a forth, forth a very interesting thesis. And it's quite simply that over the past lot of years, but most certainly the last 300 years, uh, or four, 400 a bit years, um, the left brain has done a really nice job of usurping that role and taking over the role of being a master and rendering the the right the right brain to be much more of a I think slave is a is in our culture is probably the best word or a forgotten child or a child that is not necessary you know we don't need any of that imagination here you know we don't need any of that big picture you know trying to intuitive stuff we need facts we need data you know what I mean? This is the milieu in which we live. And then Jill Bolte Taylor has, has her own take on it because of her own experience um, with a stroke and things like that, which is very interesting. So the, the bottom line here that I think we need to realize is that from, from a neuroscientist perspective, um, you know, we talk about, you know, sometimes I feel like I want to do this. And sometimes I feel like I want to do that. And Sometimes I feel certain and assured and sometimes I doubt. And, you know, sometimes when we talk about that, it's kind of like, why? I don't know. Like, I'm just flip-flopping and I have no idea why. It's like neuroscientifically speaking, um, it's because, I mean, just first, first and foremost, it's because you have two, two aspects of your brain that work in almost opposite ways. And the way that they know is almost opposite. And their personalities is almost opposite. And almost everything about them are opposite. So what is hilarious to read in, in many of the studies that both McGilchrist and Joe Bolte Taylor give us is what this looks like. Because for a lot of us and the way in which our integration of our brains has functioned, it's it it is it is um you are able to see it. And no doubt I think we all see it in a lot of different ways. Um, but for many others, um, with, if there's a severed cor corpus callosum, for example, um, that which um, bridges the two halves, um, you can see it very starkly. And it's, very, it's a very odd thing to see, or it's a very odd thing to think about, that in a very real way, as we'll go through this, um, you have two very different ways of thinking and being lodged right here. And no wonder you have a hard time choosing what to eat, you know, on Sunday for lunch, you know, let alone every other decision that we have to make. <clears throat> so a simple way of saying it, I've already basically said what I have there under the left, right, uh, left and right have very different personalities and ways of knowing and thinking. So we can get to the left brain. So it relates to dianoia, needless to say. So it is very concerned with details and logic, and it needs to understand. And in fact, one of the very interesting personality traits of the left that I think most people are not aware, and if you read either one of those books, you'll get it, is that it seems in a way to have a mind of its own. And it seems in a way to have this desire to be certain. And it's interesting because some of us who can be more left brain than others, we can turn out feeling like I'd really like to be certain. And of course, we could say, well, you know, it's because of my genes or it's because of the church culture I'm in. Sure. It's also because the left brain really, really, really wants to understand and to be certain. So what it does is it breaks things down into bite size. And so even, even if it means kind of tearing apart a picture, a big picture, as long as I can grasp it, then it's worth it, you know, from the left brain perspective. So it breaks things down and it's, it doesn't like knowing uh, it does not, it does not, what doesn't like not knowing how or why. So I put cat effect there, but we'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> so it's interesting. I already, already noted this or no, I didn't, but one of the interesting and, or, um, maybe, um, yeah, unfortunate things to learn, uh, in Il McGilchrist's book is that a lot of studies, uh, on the left side have shown very clearly that the left brain is very keen to make things up. If it cannot, it, it, there are so many studies that are hilarious that if you just give a little bit of data or, uh, or like a question to someone um, who, is, who, is, who is a severed corpus callosum and is operating in the left brain, 
and you ask them why they're there today, like, you know, the doctor will ask, why are you here today? Um, that left part of their brain will just make up a story as to why they're there, right? Not concerned whether it's true or not. It just feels really good to have a story as to know why you're here, right? And that's its primary, that's what, that's what it's trying to do. So now you can hold that in your mind as below, we'll get down to Job. And, you know, you think about a lot of the ways in which this probably can function for us. But so it kind of it kind of makes us say second guess for a second, you know, some of the ways in which we construe things and ways in which we weave things together in order for them to make sense to us. When we have a lot of data showing that the left brain just doesn't really care if it's that accurate or not. I just want to know why it is the way it is. Um, yeah, uh, needless to say, I think we're all aware that, you know, the felt experience, the experience uh, neurologically of knowing something, learning something, um, and or having a bit of knowledge to share with someone else. But I'll just say, you can say conclusively, but that doesn't have to be it. It's really just learning something, knowing something. It creates a dopamine rush, as I'm sure we're all aware. And that can be very addictive. And for those of us who read and enjoy learning, I think we can all say, yes, amen. That's kind of what happens, isn't that? Like it becomes really addictive to learn new things and to really enjoy gaining that insight. Um, and that's an important point to make just precisely because that's, that's part of what it's trying to do. So then the right brain, by contrast, as we all know, it's really keen to just zoom out for a second, just see the big picture, like the breadth and the scope and the beauty and it's not concerned with the details. Like, I, I don't really care why and how those little things fit in. I just want to see this large picture. And it's okay because of that. It's okay with not really knowing how or why. It's, 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 uh, its eyes are on a larger picture. You know, its, its tool sets are facilitating a, a much wider view. Um, so, you know, of course, some of the words that we normally give to it are, you know, artistic, creative, imaginative, because, of course, it's with our imagination that we're able to expand and that we're able to to um, well. And I'll say, obviously, I'm, I'm making this more simple because if you want to go into how imagination works. Obviously, it's a, a really wonderful synthesis of both sides of the brain, but it will be dominant by way of the right. Um, let me just hit this and let me pause if somebody wants to say something. Um, okay, I think I already said that. Okay, great. Let me just pause there before we go any further. Does anyone have any observations or thoughts even just thus far? I have something to say. Uh, I'm a very analytical person. <clears throat> and so I can see where it's putting both the left and the right. The dominant would be on the left as I am searching something, but then I like to go into the right because I am one that likes to see the big picture as well. So, but I at one time was very dominant on the analytical and I had a sister tell me, why are you so analytical? She was so simple. And uh, it got me to thinking that I had to stop and pause and I had to do a lot of praying to ask God, you gave me this beautiful analytical brain, um, help me to use it as this uh, is saying, the right brain to look at the big picture instead of just focusing on just the uh, knowing and researching side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's really good. Yeah, any other comments or thoughts? In the absence of any other right now, I was just thinking, uh, even in uh, Exodus 3 there where, and we touch on this further down, but God's name for himself, Yahweh, it really is, uh, it's interesting, maybe even a little bit humorous, the way that God has given us a name there that, uh, befuddles the left brain uh, because there is just no clear uh, conclusive meaning that that we can uh, you know you define that name by and probably pretty much by his design that uh, he's saying I'm not going to be boxed in by you 
Um, so I, interesting as you uh, talk about the propensity of the left brain to box things in. <clears throat> yeah, it's good. Yeah, anything else from anyone? Okay, if not, let me just keep going here. Um, I think I can skip this, this next one, two modes of knowing within us. I think we're largely together um, and just by way of time. So, um, you know, a question as, as it comes to this is, um, how does it inform the way that we think of doubt? Um, needless to say, um, you know, just three points um, on a conversation on doubt is not enough. There's a lot more that, that could be said. Um, not least of which um, is just making a simple distinction between doubting something um, and what that normally implies um, and the simple experience that we all have of just not having enough information, right? There, there is a difference between the two. And, or, and you could say that in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways I said it here is because I think this is how we often, we can often utilize the term is we can say, I, I doubt something by way of um, just, I'm not really sure. I don't really think it's gonna happen. Um, but oftentimes if we're talking about a person, um, it, can, it can denote um, a slight amount of distrust or a slight amount of, um, you know, it makes a statement about the character of the one in whom we're, about whom we're talking. So like in a very simple way, did John go to the store? Uh, you know, a not having enough information answer would be, hmm, I don't know. I don't know if he did or not. You know, uh, a more doubting one would be more like, uh, I doubt he did. Right. And that's, that one comes across just a little bit more like, hmm, John usually doesn't go to the store. And especially when I asked John to go to the store, you know, that kind of answer. Um, so it applies a lack of trust. I know spouses are probably thinking like, <laughs> that's we've we've had that happen a number of times haven't we uh implies just a slight amount of lack of trust now i think that's interesting um because you know the way that i uh think about james one so we'll get to james one in a second um i think some of this language that we get around doubt um you know if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about doubt by way of the left brain then of course you have to say something about um, the insane propensity towards desiring to either have all the information or to make the little amount of information that we have enough in order to make a certain or a conclusive statement. Um, so the, the right side is just gonna say, hey, hold up for a second. Like not only do you not have all the information, and not only are you viewing this from your small, finite viewpoint alone, um, but also there's loads more information that would affect the way that you think about this. And there are, there, you know, there's a, there's a much larger picture here um, to which that would be a part. So, of course, you know, some bit of the doubt that we can have about any given, you know, statement in scripture or about God, or about you know some doctrine, et cetera, is just quite simply we we don't have um, the a, a big enough picture. We don't have the whole viewpoint to be able to conclusively articulate a statement, you know, with and and back it up in a way that allows us to say um, because of this and this and this, um, I this. Now, of course, <clears throat> you hear me say that, and we say, well, but we do do that anyway. So that's where it's just becoming really aware in our own experience and articulation of why it is, how it is that we hold the beliefs, the trust, the statements, the however you'd like to say that, that we do. Um, so now going to Matthew 6 really quick. Um, this is what I think a lot is going on here is this, this splitness, you know, this, um, this duality within us. And you can talk about it in a lot of different ways. Um, if you want to utilize the words that Paul uh, utilizes, we can say the spirit and the flesh, or we can say the old self and the new self, um, or we can say this, this propensity to, to have to be correct in and of myself and or this other propensity or possibility of being able to trust and rely upon something else or someone else. So, of course, uh, Jesus notes, you cannot serve two masters. 
either will you will love one and hate the other, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually a you know, much more interesting passage than just that we have time for there. But part of the, part of the thing that is being brought up there is, is a singularity of intent and of will and of focus. And of course, the language of purity of heart denotes that which is, has the capacity of being of one mind towards something or in a relationship or in a desire, right? And of course, I think part of what Jesus is noting, at least just part of it, is whenever we are split in our desire or our will, um, uh, you could say it in a lot of different ways. We, we, don't, we don't go anywhere. We don't get anywhere. It's almost like, it's almost like being split is part of the angst that we experience um, because of the, the duality that we have. So then comes to James 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, or here, let me preface this by saying, um, I think what's interesting about the scripture is that it gets thrown around and used a lot, I know, specifically with people who, you know, who don't want somebody to have questions. And so they say, hey, James 1, don't doubt, you know. But just look at the context in which this is being um, spoken. So if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person's, person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Now, I'd, I'd love to hear any thoughts or commentary here, but just, just to make a note or two on this is, you know, of course, this is being this is put within this context of, it's almost like the question is, do you trust that the Father or God is generous enough and is willing to extend to you the wisdom and that which you need in the moment? Do you trust that or do you not? Um, and of course, part of the language to me, it denotes, do you trust the character of the one to whom you are asking? And then part of it to me is also, do you trust that you can actually receive it? Do you trust that you are able to hear that? Or do you think that um, there's no way that I can that I can hear that or receive that? I mean, I'm just a sinner after all. And again, this is where part of I think Paul's language for doubting comes in. Do you believe that you are in Christ, or do you not? And part of the way that that will play out is the way in which you experience your you are not just asking, but your your trust in your own ability to receive. And I say your own. And I, and I don't mean specifically like I as in Ryan, but I, Ryan, as the vehicle in which the spirit of Christ is able to hear and receive and be able to be a conduit of that, of those words and or that action um, and or that communication. Do you trust that you're able to hear? I think that's a really important question. So let me pause there. Um, I know we have one or two more points right there, but let me pause there. Does anyone have any any thoughts on that scripture or anything right there? While uh, anyone else may be queuing up. Okay, yeah, go ahead, please. Here, we got uh, Haley. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that like, Ryan, what you said about um, like when people don't, um, like don't want people to have questions. They're like, James chapter one, don't doubt. Asking mm -hmm. questions doesn't necessarily mean that you're doubting. It means that you're, you know, thirsting for knowledge. And I think that it's important to remember that just because you're asking questions doesn't mean that you're doubting. You, you know, you want to learn more, so. Yeah, 100% well said. Yeah, and of course I was speaking from, the same, uh, you know, agreeing with the angle that you've taken and the way in which you think about that, speaking from the unfortunate angle that is often given by many who do not see questioning as thirsting for knowledge. They would see questioning as you must doubt something. You must, you must be having some kind of problem. But yeah, thanks for what you said. That's 100%. Ryan, I would... Uh... I would also notice another theme in James is this whole struggle we have with loving the world. And, mm. and so it seems like one of the things that James is dealing with is not that uh, left brain issue, but the right brain issue. 
where is your relationship? It's one thing to have questions about, you know, what's right, what's wrong, uh, what should I do, uh, and then go to God. But I think what what this may be sort of saying is what's really important in some ways, even more important than your specific questions is the bigger question of what is your relationship with God. Mm. And uh, without that right brain relationship of knowing God, uh, that a, a relationship that transcends having all the answers, mm-hmm. then you're not likely to be led by God uh, mm-hmm. because you don't, you love the world perhaps more than you love God. Mm. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's really good. I was just going to say, Ryan, that as you get on down, even through the word there, Daisuke and the, the, the double minded, double wheeled, it begins to bring together the point that you were making about it, it gives a, a new perspective on, on what it means there to doubt. Do we, do we know the Lord well enough that we trust him to act on these promises that we've made or do we not know him or we, on, we only know him in a very harsh or shallow way where we, we, we don't have the resources for dealing with uh, the things that we face in our lives. So, um, mm. Marcus, did you yeah. have something? Yes, sir. And I just, I would add to this conversation. When you look at uh, this verse and you look at uh, verse six, and what sticks out to me when we're talking about this doubt situation, he's saying, but when you ask, you must believe. Okay, and I doubt. So I'm, what I get from it, this is that when it comes to doubting, he's saying you must first believe because if you doubt, you're not going to believe anything that I say. Okay, because if you don't believe and I give you an answer and then you still doubt, then you're going to ask me another question about the doubt that you had before that, and I'll answer that one. And then you're going to give me another question about a doubt that you have. So he was saying, like, don't take me down this road if you don't believe. You know, I can move to the next man, okay, who really wants to believe. And it's like she said, a uh, young lady was saying before, asking questions about her belief. But if you don't believe, it's not worth your while to ask me questions because like the next part of the verse says because if you do doubt you're just like a a wave in the sea blowing back and forth you're never going to be settled okay so i think that we should always put that keep this in context uh we don't believe then we not we need not be in class tonight yeah Mm -hmm. good that's good. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. No, yeah, well, good. Well, thanks for all those comments. Any other, anything else before we keep going? Okay, if not, great. Uh, Dad, I'll pass it over to you for the Joe bit. Yeah, and I try, you will have time to go through this and uh, read more there. Uh, when Ryan was talking at the beginning about dianoia and epinoia, uh, about knowing, and then as he said, still yet related to metanoia, which we commonly translate as just repent. But if we hear what Jesus is really saying there, uh, meta, you know, transcending, uh, that goes beyond uh, our minds, the way that we would normally approach God with this boxing him in and unless we unless we change our whole way of thinking unless we go beyond that uh you know we're not going to uh be able to walk with him follow him we're not going to be able to participate in this kingdom uh the way that he he wants us to so i uh you may have something to say on that later but uh, it might have been good for us to put that up there right next to uh, Dianoia and uh, Epinoia. Uh, so 
Brian talked about, uh, yeah, we can see some of this played out in Job, and we haven't gone into depth here. That is so, we'll just say it right up front. There's so much more that uh, could be said here about Job. We have just barely scratched the surface, and we have, uh, you know, in, if anything, overly simplified it as we uh, just tried to put a little bit in here. Uh, but you see uh, some, you know, different dynamics at work here in Job, the different uh, uh, theologies on display. Uh, so uh, again, an oversimplification, his, free, his three friends, uh, God would have been on your side, but you sinned. So now God is against you until you repent. Uh, so they, you know, they're, they're anything, that, you know, it, they're just not creative. They just keep coming back around. It is the same song, you know, 12th verse <laughs> by the time you're at the end of, of, of theirs. And they're, they just, they cannot see beyond, you know, I wear these glasses that my lenses through which I view things. And, and that is our worldview. They, they had no other, uh, you know, worldview there to view this just except it can be stated in different ways, but that is, that is one way to state it there. His wife's uh, view perspective is something like God. It's obvious. God's not on your side. Just give up, curse God and die. Uh, uh, tweaked a little bit from, you know, what his three friends were, were saying. Uh, here, it's a little more fatalistic. Well, don't even worry about repenting. Just curse God and die and put yourself out of your misery. Job, you know, uh, again, uh, others can, you know, frame it differently, but I've not sinned in this matter. Thus, God is unjust by letting this happen to me. Uh, frame it in some different ways, but you, you listen to him. We, we talk about the patience of Job, and there are some, of course, he has, as, as would be understandable, he has some sterling moments. He has some, you know, moments of deep belief and trust uh, in God, uh, though he slay me yet, well, I still trust in him. But he certainly has his emotional roller coaster moments uh, where he is, is saying, uh, you're wrong, God, in the way that you are dealing uh, with me in this. And then even accuses him, yes, of, of wrongdoing, demanding his day in court. Um, and then, of course, he, he gets it. After the Lord doesn't answer any of his questions, uh, but just speaks of his sovereignty, you have there Job 42. Job replied, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Um, and, you know, we don't bring that in. We don't bring it to bear on the discussion to say, well, so our only response is, is just to not try, just to shut up and not try. No, not at all. But when Job uh, finally looked through, you know, a different pair of glasses, he came to a very different conclusion. Uh, instead of uh, you are unjust to deal with me in this way, uh, that was totally set aside now. New glasses see, sees God in ways that, that blows his mind. And his response is, what can I say? <laughs> I, I, words fail me. Uh, which is a good place to, to be in, to, to get a glimpse of God in that way that goes beyond our knowing. And that is part of the, uh, the, the whole point in, in this. So we, we, we place this in the larger discussion of deconstruction and some of the faith crises, you know, that people, you know, uh, maybe going through people we love, know some of our own uh, questions. Of where, does this, where does this fit in? What does this kind of, of, of deeper knowing have to say about uh, crises that we or someone else might be facing. Well, 
at least part of the answer is it's relevant, yes, to help that person to, uh, to see uh, in a different way that you, you've, maybe you have felt that you have no other option because of other things that we've read, quotes that are worthwhile focusing on from Giles, uh, that if we just, if we're adamant, dogmatic about our certainty and uh, these tenets, and if you don't hold to these, you don't belong. When someone's been driven away, they have no option but to walk away in the face of some, in their minds, no option but to walk away in the face of something like this. If we can bring, of course, the other party needs it as much, but that person that we care about shepherding, we can bring the person to say, no, no, there, there is more. There is another way of knowing. Don't, don't walk away from this trust, uh, faith in God, because there is a much deeper way of knowing this, uh, what can be a very one-sided or shallow view of God uh, is not the only way. It's not to demean, it's not the purpose isn't to be mean-spirited ourselves towards that view, but to try to help uh, others understand there's so much more there about God. I'll pause, <clears throat> excuse me, being a little bit croaky tonight, I'll pause there for any other reflections, input, uh, Brian, yourself, others, there's much more that can be done with Job, and please feel free, David, or anyone else to, uh, to add to that uh, in a way that helps clarify what we're talking about tonight. Thanks. Yes, please, go ahead, Anita. So in the, in the thought process of, like you said, bringing bringing someone who has possibly been hurt and bringing them back to um, the knowledge that, that there's a better way of, of knowing. Does that, does that translate into a just trust your gut type of, I, I know, and cause I know that we're saying more. So uh, going all the way back up to um, even before the James scripture, when we said, do you, do you know, and do you believe that God is a God of love? So my thought was, you know, a lot of times we say, well, the difference between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, right? That the, the New Testament God is a God of love. But when we look at the Old Testament God, when God wiped out entire civilizations, um, you know, that, that kind of split between those two. So how do we, how do we bring people uh, in without just saying, well, just trust your gut about how you feel on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear, I understand. Sometimes it's it's hard to even frame the questions that we are that we're thinking or trying to articulate, especially on the spot like that. Um, and please let uh, others others of you weigh in. But uh, my my own response, and I would I would want to be able to respond respond that no. It doesn't have to be just, you know, trust trust your gut that uh, there is a place and a function of, for the the left brain to to look at these uh, these wonders we see about God. So that we still, as one of the prophets, say, "Come, let us reason together. Let us let us study together. Let us talk together and communicate together." So that person still does need community there's going uh, again ephesians 3 uh even if someone wants to say yes i just believe that he's a god of love well paul's going to say you got to have community to, to really know the depth and the breadth of god's love it's not going to happen you know just on your gut feeling so you know i that that could you know that response would have its own uh, detractions and and pitfalls if it's just on what I feel that we we can come back to like wow there's so much that we can see in here and uh, you know many of the the two and three step forward scriptures Exodus 34 and others uh, God is compassionate and full of mercy and loving kindness there's so much that we can look at there that will give us a basis you know for this a, a, a rationale which speaks to me because I've tended to be 
too heavy on the left brain. But um, uh, David, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the interesting things that I've noticed, especially in the Old Testament, is how much the Old Testament writers go through this doubt process. I mean, so many of the Psalms begin with doubt. They begin with crying out, what's going on? Why? Why do you do this? Uh, some of the prophets like Habakkuk, how can you be this way? Uh, Jeremiah and his lamenting. And yet there is a almost a literary device in it, and that they keep coming back to, but I remember this is what I'm going to trust. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's like what Job is trying to tell us or what we're trying to learn in the book of Job is that there will be times when it will not make sense. And in those times, you're going to have to look at the bigger picture of who I am and who you are. And are you going to doubt me? Or are you going to doubt your doubts? Uh, those are the, that's your choice. And God is, uh, is appealing to us to trust him even in those moments when we can't understand him uh, and nowhere does he do that more than in the cross where even Jesus goes through this process of couldn't there be another way? Trust me, you know, more than your hesitation in this moment. So I, I, I think this, you know, I don't, I don't, when we refer to our gut, I think we refer to something that's, that seems a little, uh, tentative or relativistic and I think what God is calling us to is don't don't base your final conclusions on your ability to put it put it all together yeah that's good thank you thank you David Brian yeah that is really good thank you for that and thanks for the question Anita I think that's just this is a very good and honest question that I think we all you know, struggle with, um, of course, um, let me just hit, I can't hit the whole question, especially as it relates to Old Testament and New Testament, but just to say something really quick on that is, um, I know I noted it just up in this document, um, but, and not that it matters to have to utilize the, the left and right brain. You don't have to, if that's not helpful for you. But what I think is interesting about that, even as David just noted, is that oftentimes, um, we can have this deep, what feels to be and largely correlated with right-brained, you know, trust and uh, this kind of big, big picture trust in the character of God. And of course, we'll say something about this a little bit as we get down, because it's going to come directly towards um, as it relates to Jesus. Um, but we can we can have this big picture trust. And it's kind of this general, we feel this general thing of, yep. I, I trust, like, <clears throat> I feel, you know, in my life right now, I can trust God with anything, whatever. And then what happens? A situation comes. So here comes, here comes the left brain, though. And that's why it's interesting is because here comes a specific. And so now you have to figure out how to correlate this specific with this big picture. And if they at all juxtapose, if they at all feel um, like they don't go together, then that's really difficult. And I mean, that's that's part of where the pain and the so-called, you know, um, doubting or this this process comes from. And I just think it's it's helpful for me to think about it in those terms, because I know that's that's how it kind of plays out in my life, too. You know, when things are going halfway decent, I have a really nice right brain, big picture, man. <laughs> God's awesome. Trust everything. You know, it's really great. The moment you get even just a slight specific instance in which the left brain has to hone in and say, okay, what about this situation? I know we have this big picture. So how does this correlate with this situation? Right. And sometimes again, like I said, either you have an ability to walk through it or like, like David said, if you don't have an ability to walk through it or to correlate, then it, it asks you to, to doubt one of them, either, either you doubt the one in whom you're trusting, or you can doubt your doubts you can trust, rely on what you know to be true in that deeper sense. But here is the thing for me, my own experience as it relates to the gut, like your question about the gut, 
is, and I completely agree with the, uh, like David noted, that <clears throat> that generally has a very um, not a relativistic feel, but certainly a, um, uh, I can, you know, my gut tells me to do this, so I'm going to do it. Well, one of the problems with that is that um, we know um, a lot of how and why the gut responds as it does. So I would, I tend to think about it like, and I know we'll have a scripture right down here and we'll say something about this, but I tend to think about it like Paul's constant insistence that you walk with the spirit and that you keep in step with the spirit. So I, I tend to think about it like in my, my own experience has been the more time that I spend in, in whatever it is for you is completely fine. I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, you know, Paul, you know, either unhelpfully or helpfully does not say utilize these kinds of practices to, to learn how to walk with the spirit, to keep in step with the spirit. But for me, it has been uh, long periods of silence and or a centering prayer practice. And the practice for me has been the more that I do that on specific, um, specific days, specific weeks, the more that I feel in tune with and I feel in aligned with the <clears throat> not just not just my own awareness of trust and in whom I'm trusting, but I feel in alignment with what a, kind of a felt knowing of what um, I don't want to say what I know to be true, but more like in a moment to moment basis, a trust that the words, the the not answers, but the words, the guidance, the actions will will either come to me in a clear way or will be just guided through me and now sometimes i have no clue um if that's being done or not and i can doubt whether or not i feel uh, whether or not i'm in alignment and this is where once again um james one and marcus as you said it is it is that growing in trust and growing in the ability to discern and be in alignment with um the mind of christ i think we could say uh, which is the spirit um, for me, that's important. And that's what I hear you saying by way of like, you trust your, your gut knowing. So I would say it like um, you trust the heart's knowing uh, the heart in the Christian tradition and in wisdom traditions is the space of alignment or communion with that, which is the divine or the other than ourselves. So I would say it like that just by way of now. Now, here's where, of course, this is where the left brain is helpful is because the left brain will want to pull in well hey ryan like you're you're feeling an alignment in this way which is allowing you to speak and or to think in this way um you know what about what about some of this other what about the rest of the tradition what about your brother over here who said this what about the rest of them and you know in your church etc you know pulling in pulling in the other specifics of data and that's where i think like dad said you know it's it's the it's the interesting balance of learning as an individual to be in alignment with spirit um, and to be able to hear the prompt and guidance from our brothers and sisters, which is to say the community. And of course, the community can be, you know, via books and via the tradition as well. But somehow that balance there, um, anyway, I've said plenty there, but you get what I'm saying. No, Ryan, if you want to, uh, I think here as we come down to uh, our last 20 minutes. Uh, if you want to make any observation there, I'll go through just highlighting some of the other scriptures that in uh, for the two weeks that you have before we meet again, I pulled all of these together and put them there on the uh, reflecting on scripture page and you'll be going back through them more, more slowly. So we're not going to try to go over all of them tonight in in detail we had some more material after these scriptures but ryan was there uh, anything on these besides the galatians 5 that you wanted to reflect on briefly oh just real quick it just never ceases to amaze me the first corinthians 13 um any you know all of those words that are within that whole chapter are particularly thought-provoking and challenging and critiquing in a lot of different ways um, but the specifically here is the way in which it is stating that knowledge as well as other things will pass away, but that, that which will not pass away is the, is love, which is to say the, the experience, the desire, the willingness to be in alignment with the, the love that is in Christ, which is to say the mind of Christ. Um, and then, of course, the little bits that we get about an understanding of 
the ways in which we used to see as a child, we thought like a child, we reasoned like a child. And then as he said, when I matured, when I became as a man, I put away the, the childish ways behind me. Um, of course, now we only see in part as a reflection in a mirror. Um, and then when we shall see face to face, or then we shall see face to face, um, now we know in part, um, and then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known, which is a really interesting way of saying that, that would be great if we had more time to go into, but, um, and then the one that I already noted, Galatians 6, um, and then, yeah, the other scriptures that are worth noting that, um, as it relates to what I was just saying, are, are further down there, but I'll wait, um, Dad, you can go ahead and hit the rest of these. Well, I'll just go briefly. I think it's, uh, as Ryan brought out there in the First Corinthians 13, of course, we think of it just the great chapter on love. But uh, now I know in part, and there is this tenor throughout scripture, this posture of having this humility about us, recognizing our limitations. And here's Paul, you know, Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, as to the righteousness of the law, flawless. And he has the humility, the wherewithal to say, I only, I only understand in part. Uh, you know, then face to face, we'll know fully, even, even as I am fully known. But so that I know in part, we see it. I can't overstate the emphasis and importance of what Ryan is saying there, living by the Spirit uh, after the fruit of the Spirit. And since our whole life is wrapped up in the Spirit, we need to learn to keep in step with the Spirit. But even David, you go back, uh, David, David and Langford talked about uh, that, uh, you know, their, their, their questioning and their doubt is just uh, right out in the open. And, and that's true. And, and then you have them. Uh, you know, also stating like, uh, I believe David in this one, my heart's not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too wonderful for me. That doesn't mean that we don't try to wrap our brains around the greatness of God. But this, this statement that I recognize my limitations, there, there's not an arrogance about me that I've got it all figured out. Uh, because, and then we talked about this knowing God on a deeper level, and he says that here, I've quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, and we think we've noted before in here, you know, what would typically a weaned child in a quiet, you know, in a still moment, not, not nursing, not doing anything, just loving being there on the breast of, of his or her mother, for us to be able to be in God's presence that way, that place for knowing God on a deeper level, even away from speech, away from words. Um, Jeremiah is, is good and just that he says, if you want to boast about anything, let it be that you really know and understand me, know in that intimate way of knowing, not just knowing about, but knowing me uh, and that he delights in exercising kindness, justice, and, and righteousness, because that very well could be a different view of God than we might have grown up with. Um, I just think it's so significant in John 9, the whole, you know, the, the great story of Jesus with, with the blind man, and then at the end of it, the blind man responds great. You know, he's just as a, uh, open, eager, uh, the Pharisees, you know, at the closing of it, uh, a little differently, verse 40, some who were with him said, what, are we blind too? You're saying we, we're blind? Jesus, uh, if you were truly blind, if you recognized your limitations, uh, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now that you claim, you see, your guilt remains. And I think it, it we, got, we know he's talking to those who thought they had it all figured out. And we, we just have to have a, a place for that in our understanding when we think we have it figured out, you know, with, with all the answers. He says, be careful. You're really blind. You know, your, uh, your guilt uh, remains there. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, Kirk. I, I didn't mean to raise my hand if I did. No, no. I uh, just saw you unmuted there. So just wanted to be sure and give you a, a chance. Uh, Thanks, 
then I'll just go ahead with uh, Romans 11 before he transitions from the, you know, the first 11 chapters. Uh, wow, look at what God has done for us in Christ before he goes into 12. Of, so this is how we should live. And he just breaks out in worship. Uh, he says, oh my goodness, uh, this astounds me. The depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Uh, his paths are beyond tracing out. Who's known the mind of the Lord or been his counsel or who's ever given to God, he should repay him from him, through him, to him are all things. Uh, you know, Paul's, Paul's response is like, again, just you know, mind-blowing. Wow. When I consider all that God has done, this great plan that he has worked out, is what, what, what is the common saying, you know, um, it's not just if reason, if words, if reason fails you, try worship, try, you know, uh, doxology, just, just worship of God. Uh, we've touched on 1 Corinthians 2, we'll let you reflect on that. Uh, Philippians 4, we, we know it, we say it often, the peace of God. But something there that transcends understanding, some, some things about God that, you know, our left brain just cannot uh, fully describe or, or understand. Paul's, we've, we've touched on this one, Second Timothy 1, um, that it's just significant that Paul's statement here is, uh, I know whom I have believed. Uh, he's not, it's not a list of dogmas. It's not, I know exactly. Uh, you know, and it's not that Paul was wishy-washy on those. We're not, we don't advocate bad doctrine, bad theology. That hurts, that hurts people. Uh, but it's significant that he says, I know whom I have believed in, in Christ. And I can trust him for that. We've mentioned Jude 22, be merciful to those who doubt. I did look it up. I'm sorry, I can't give you uh, more information here. Uh, different word from the James 1, Daisuke being two-minded, different word used here for, for doubt. It's not this, be merciful to the one who's, who's unstable in his thinking that doesn't, you know, that, that just cannot trust God. It's, it's, a, it's a different one. It's maybe more along the line of, of what you were saying, Haley, that there's the understanding of those who are searching, uh, asking questions, uh, you know, uh, different. Yeah, doesn't have. Uh, not claiming to have all the answers. Well, Ryan, I'm going to stop there. Uh, still have, um, I know we don't, we don't want to just uh, uh, take up all of it. Uh, David, you have something I'd love for you to share. Uh, yes, um, I was um, reading a kind of a devotion and it was called, um, Have You Considered? Evidence Beyond a Reasonable Doubt by Bruce Malone. And it just goes through there and talks about how God can design things. Uh, biology uh, inferences where he's uh, designed different animals the way they are. And, you know, uh, but it's my left brain can't even figure what the right when you read some of this stuff it's just beyond comprehension and it's just you just realize how omniscient the lord is and how mm -hmm. he has developed things that we're kind of catch catching up to um yeah. <laughs> speaking of being blind there's, there's these bug eyes that are night vision goggles that gives you a whole bigger degree of field of vision that just been developed by thousands of man hours which um they copied the idea by a uh, parasitic fly so it's just um so things that you yeah. read in here are just phenomenal that you know you just don't uh hear or yeah. imagine no that's good thank you for sharing that david and lanny uh go well, ahead if you don't mind i'll give a little personal testimony um, sure. This whole topic tonight, uh, and the whole class for that matter, but it's very, very personal. And it's in my own deconstruction and reconstruction of faith. Uh, of course, this has been uh, ground zero, this whole idea of certainty. 
Um, I don't know what the makeup of, of your class is here tonight. I don't know what the religious background is, but for those of us who have come up through the uh, um, Church of Christ, of course, institutionally, using the metaphor of right and left brain, uh, Church of Christ is as left brain as you can possibly get with no room for the right brain, in, in my experience. And um, that that creates a, a way of thinking and, and teaching and acting that's uh, uh, really very limiting. And it, it, when, when you think of God only in terms of the written word, uh, it's hard for the Holy Spirit to break through that. And when your salvation depends on being right in every detail, um, it doesn't make a, a very attractive situation. And it also opens one up, myself up, for uh, a continual struggle every time something comes up to challenge my rightness. So uh, the things that we're talking about here are very practical and they're very important. And um, I just uh, I just think that uh, letting the right brain work in a way that we can begin to, as you have said over and over again, know God instead of just knowing about God is just totally fundamental to uh, having a a whole full relationship with God. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lanny, for sharing that because that is that is helpful, and and even those that would come from a different uh, church background probably can relate to some components of that of, of what you're what you're sharing uh, because there is you know so much. Uh, Com, you know, common denominators there, uh, even for some of the different backgrounds. Um, and I just, I think it can just be uh, so, so helpful for us to hear from one another like that. So your, your sharing is just, is um, so, so helpful. Um, I would say, Ryan, um, uh, as we, come down to the end, there were several things that were highlighted throughout the rest. It doesn't mean it's the only thing worthwhile reading in there. It was some of the things that we're gonna just try to hit on. Uh, so you can see oh, a little bit more than we have time for in the, in the next um, five minutes. So uh, Stan, I'm gonna hand it off to you briefly to see if there's any closing, uh, you know, comments uh, before we wrap up here tonight <clears throat> yeah that's good thanks i i don't think we'll we need to maybe uh, go through much of this here i think you can read it and if it's helpful for you great um, there's a research a resource there um, that will help you even more and it's a it's a wonderful wonderful book wonderful resource on this whole idea that we've been talking about tonight. Um, I think I, I could just point us to just by way of closing. Um, you know, I really appreciate uh, what you shared there, Lanny. And um, just to dovetail with that and then to close, um, you can see the first highlighted um, point um, where it begins the goal. Uh, maybe we could just read that together because that's, I think, what we all just keep coming back to. Uh, the goal of the spiritual life is to meet God and to keep on meeting God, walking together as friend with friend. Knowing about God isn't the goal. And then as an example, the core activity of the spiritual life is in prayer, or we could say in communion or communication um, with God. Knowing a lot about prayer isn't the same thing as praying. And we all know that, but that's just a simple way to say that. And, you know, this is one of those areas that um, I've been impacted by. Um, and I know Lanny, I appreciate has a really good practice of, of sitting in prayer and, and, and of prayer and silence. And <clears throat> I've been impacted by individuals within the larger Christian tradition um, who make this the keystone part of their day. You know, like the, I think that one of the ways in which we 
you know, some of us, I know some of you probably do way better at this than I do. And, but allow me to speak for the, you know, the mass of us in Western um, Christianity that um, it's pretty hard to find time in your day for prayer. That's what I often hear. And um, most people, if I talk about anything like centering prayer or a silent practice, um, it's usually met with, ah, just don't have time for that. Like, I don't know how you get in 30 minutes, you know, let alone an hour. Um, and there's a period of my life where um, <clears throat> I just made a commitment to be in silence for three hours a day. Um, and even that's nothing. So like I was challenged by those in our tradition, our greater tradition. Um, who make this such a key part of their day that they'll they will do without fail four or five hours every day, and of course they have they still work they still have families they wake up really early they they do it as they're closing last few hours before bed they just make a commitment on it um, and I think it's interesting because I think some of the some of the everything that we've been talking about tonight I think part of what it comes down to is this question of um, how much time do we spend how much do we care to be in communion communication with god as friend as father um, with the spirit keeping in step with the spirit how much time do we give to that and now not that not that you have to do it in meditation or silence you can do it all throughout the day we all appreciate brother lawrence's book and we can we can find ways of being in communion with god all throughout the day in all the all the various tasks that we go through but how much, how much do we make that of importance in our, in our lives, in our days? And that's where, you know, there was one individual who I was um, talking with, um, who was a friend of mine in Malawi, who, you know, I asked him, how does he stay in alignment with, um, with the spirit of Christ and or be, um, I could sit, you know, I could ask that in a lot of different questions. And I can't remember how I asked it. But his, his response was so simple. It was like, if that is the primary thing that you want, if you are single-minded in your desire to be in communion and in alignment with the mind of Christ, then that is how you'll spend your day. And that's how you will align your day. That's how you'll find ways of being able to, to align yourself with that. So I found that to be very challenging and or a critique to myself because I was like many left brain dominant and part of being left brain dominant is that we're really good at productivity and really good at making task lists and really good at checking things off of the the list every day and if if you know 30 minutes is sufficient for a prayer time you know or maybe 15 you know but the, the different ways the different ways in which whatever way is most helpful or appropriate to you maybe it can be a challenge for all of us like what would it feel like to to keep in step with spirit in a way in which we, we spent and or uh, spent the dominant mental energy that we have each day to actually allow ourselves to be in alignment. You know, what would it feel like then when you ask questions about specifics that come up in your life or when you ask questions from that perspective, um, you know, of scripture or theology, it feels very different. And I'll, I'll be honest, like for myself, um, and, and I'm not, I, I don't do this as well as I would like to. Um, but those periods of my life where I know that I was giving my dominant mental energy to, to experience what it feels like to be in step with spirit, um, you, you don't have the same kinds of questions. And in fact, um, you don't have many questions um, because the thing that really matters is there and it's the foundation and it's what you're standing on and it's what you're you're walking in alignment with so some of the other periphery stuff that we can tend to feel is really important it just kind of falls and then you know when the difficult things difficult situations come up um, the alignment is enough to to guide you through and it, and it doesn't have to be such a crisis every single time you know so I just I experienced this in a way in which um, you know, I wish there was, well, no, I don't wish that there was a way in which we could all do it, um, you know, in the same way at the same time, whatever is good for you, whatever is best for you, spend time, ask spirit, what is the most helpful way for me to stay in alignment? Um, maybe do that. Maybe just give yourself a challenge as we move forward. Um, just, just double the amount of time that you've been spending. If it's five minutes, make it 10, 
and no problem and just slowly build up and of course be gracious to yourself and i'm not saying any of this to say you better be doing five hours tomorrow or or else <laughs> <clears throat> but it's more like just just ask yourself you know uh, or challenge yourself like um, what would that feel like? And really, I think that was the thing that got me. It was a very right-minded, right, uh, you know, right-brained question. It was imagination. It was like, man, I wonder what it would feel like to be so in tuned and aligned and to be so in communion that when things come up, they just wouldn't be a big deal. Like, what would that feel like? You know, I've never, I've never experienced that. I still, you know, I take things as a big deal, even slight irritations that come up, you know? And anyway, I'll pause there. That's more than enough. But I thought that was a that was a good just paragraph there to end on, especially appreciating what Lanny shared there. So yeah. any comments, questions on on anything from the class? Barb, I know you had your hand up and won't make you put it back, uh, you know, up again. But uh, if you wanted to share something, please feel free to. Ryan uh, basically spoke it. Um, I had a friend ask me one time what it meant to pray unceasingly and and it takes practice but uh i told him i just talked to god all day long i said you can talk to him all day long while you're working yeah you have to focus on what you need to focus on but it, it takes a lot of practice and i talked to him all day long and so ryan touched on that and that yeah. works for me to um uh, stay in line. Now, I haven't uh, mastered things not kind of disturbing me or kind of throwing me off when some things happen. I haven't uh, mastered that yet, but I am working on it. Thank you, yeah. Brian, because you, you said it perfectly. Yeah, it is well said. And, and I'll say not just as is, as is that. I think I would say it even if I was just uh, observing the life of someone else that um, you can see the effects of of seeking to walk in alignment, uh, uh, even in in Ryan's life. I know you were being uh, not not an hum. It wasn't you know what a false humility there. I, I I agree with you in saying how far we have to go, but you can see the effects in someone's life uh, when they are seeking to be centered. There is just a. It's like you know you try to visualize it a a weight a depth that that uh, just uh, creates a, a good center of gravity where when we face those things uh, we're not just all over the place with it and and that's what we all desire i think of the hebrews picture as we have this we have this anchor for our souls that goes deep into the presence of god and that that helps it doesn't mean that we won't ever be uh, off the wall sometimes uh, <laughs> but that we uh, there, there's a momentum that keeps us keeps us rooted. Well, we will pause there, uh, pause for two weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy the break next week, and then we will come back together uh, two weeks from tonight. So, until then, the Lord be with you, bless you, and we'll look forward to meeting up again a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.